1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. So what is the good news? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. God is holy. He's without sin, and he's just, which means he's righteous. For the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 99, verse 9. We are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 We all deserve death and separation from God due to our sins, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 But the good news tells us that God loves us even though we are sinners. God has given his only begotten Son in order to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ died in our place and rose from death. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 tells us, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Heaven is a free, is a free gift for sinners. We receive this gift only by faith and only through Christ. It is not a reward for those who do good things or good works. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9. God promises us that whoever believes only in his Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation can know with absolute certainty that they have eternal life. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. God promises us that we can never lose our salvation. God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are who keeps us saved. Verses 28 and 29 says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So would you accept the fact that you deserve hell, since that is God's judgment? But at the same time, God loves us in such a way that he has given his son to die on the cross in our place. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. So by simply believing in him instead of our good works, we can be saved if you trust in Jesus Christ alone to obtain salvation and not any of your good deeds or your good works. So how can you be saved? Well, it's very simple. You believe in Jesus, the son of God. You believe that he is who he says he is, God in the flesh. You believe in his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and he's coming back for us very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's all it takes is you put your faith and your trust in him and him alone. No one who believes and puts their, faith, their trust in Jesus will ever be disappointed. The doctrine of light is the very essence of the gospel, which is centered in Jesus Christ and his atonement. To understand light means to understand the nature and divine character of the Savior himself. He unequivocally declared, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8 verse 12. When the Lord saved us, he made us children of light. He called out of the darkness, um, he called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. Jesus said in John twelve forty six, 
whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And see also Acts 26, verse 18, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. When God said, let there be light, he divided the light from the darkness. The trouble with Christians come when they don't divide the light from the darkness. We are to have no communion with darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. After we have been saved out of darkness and been made um, children of light, we get, um, how do we get drawn back into the darkness? Well, that would be by unrighteousness. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Children of light know that we are messing with darkness when we try to find a way to keep something in the dark that should be totally in the light. Um, according to Romans 13, 12-13, honesty stands against the work of darkness. Christ will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. So be honest and keep everything in the light and have no communion with darkness. By worldly pleasures and pursuits, John 1, verse 5 and John 3, 19, the world is darkness. And when you get drawn back into worldly pleasures, you get drawn back into darkness. The way for um, children of light to keep from being drawn back into darkness um, is to learn to savor, enjoy, and be content with living in God's marvelous light. Um, you can be drawn back in by an evil eye. Luke 11, 34 through 35. We have an evil eye when we look at what God doesn't want us to see or when we look the wrong way at what he does want us to see. The way to keep your eye um, single is to desire the light. God's light is very bright. It begins to dim when our eyes start wandering. Watch out for television, the internet, and your smartphones. They can fill, your, um, fill you with darkness in a hurry. Stay in the light of God's word instead. You can be drawn into darkness by hating a brother. 1 John chapter 2, 9-11 through 11. When you hate your brother or a brother, whether you would admit it or not, and whether you believe it or not, you are in darkness and you have blinded your eyes. When children of light walk in darkness, they stumble. When they walk in light, they have no, no occasion of stumbling. And people can also be drawn into darkness by not walking with Jesus. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. God is the light and in him is no darkness at all. If you're having fellowship with him, you, um, if, you're, if you're not having fellowship with him, you are walking in darkness. Conversely, when you walk with him, you walk in his light. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7. If you find that sin has affected your fellowship with the Lord, then get that sin under the blood of Jesus Christ and get back in the light. Another way you can be drawn into the darkness is by Satan. Ephesians 6, 12. Children of light can succumb to spiritual wickedness and the power of darkness. Colossians 1, uh, 13. If you give place to the devil and he takes you captive, um, you might think you are walking in light since he is an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. But you will be in total darkness. The way, the way back out into the light is to acknowledge the truth and repent. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Children of light have no business in darkness because light has no communion with darkness. Stay in the light. Let your light shine is a phrase from the Bible. Matthew 5, 16, where Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The phrase can have multiple meanings, including showing others what Jesus looks like, Jesus is considered the true light, and letting your light shine means showing others what Jesus looks like through your life, and being a light to others. Jesus compares a lamp to a person who is meant to be placed on a stand to give light to those around them, and encourage people to be a light to, to all those around them, regardless of whether they are outgoing or timid. This can be done by interacting with people and building relationships. 
and living for the glory of God. This verse asks people to live in a way that is consumed by what others think of um, by what others think of God rather than themselves and to live so that others give glory to God. This can be done in many ways including compassion, showing kindness and compassion to everyone, humility, confessing sins before God and others, generosity, sharing God's um, God-given blessings with those in need, forgiveness, seeking reconciliation with those who have wronged you. In Matthew 5:16. Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Of course, it is not technically our light that should shine um, before others. It is the light of Christ entrusted to believers as light bearers. In other words, we do not produce the light within us. God does. And through our good works, people may glorify the one who gives that light. One of the ways of, um, to let our light shine before others is to show compassion to others. Jesus expressed deep compassion for all people, regardless of their ethnic background, social status, gender, or personal beliefs. Um, as Christians, we should follow his example by showing compassion and, and kindness to everyone. And another way to let our light shine before others is to practice humility. Christians are called to be humble in all things, knowing that it is only through the grace of God that we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 28. Humility also means the willingness to confess our sins before God and others. Luke 15, 21. James 5, 16. In doing so, we demonstrate our receptability, um, our receptive receptivity to correction and guidance in Proverbs 15 32 generosity is another means of letting our light shine before others Christians are called to be generous with their money time resources and love Romans 12 13 Hebrews 13 verse 16 after all everything that we have belongs to God Deuteronomy 10 14 so we should share our God-given blessings with those in need and give without expecting anything in return. Luke 6, verse 30. Forgiveness, too, is a means of letting our light shine before others. Jesus taught that we should forgive others as we have been forgiven. Matthew um, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. So we should seek reconciliation with those who have wronged us and with those whom we have wronged to promote peace and unity. There are many ways to let our light shine before others. Um, we can volunteer at a soup kitchen or um, homeless shelter, donate money to a charity, or be kind and compassionate to someone in need. We can also lend an ear to a friend who is going through a tough time and offer a word of encouragement. Or we can simply smile and say hello to a stranger on the street. Perhaps the best way to let our light shine um, before others is to share the gospel. The good news with others. The good news is that God redeems sinners through, um, through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. If we believe in the person and work of Christ, who he is and what he did, then we are saved from internal condemnation. We should not keep this message to ourselves. Good news is meant to be shared and we should make it visible for everyone to see. Matthew 28, 19. The ultimate purpose of letting our light shine before others is not to draw attention to ourselves or to promote our own interests. Rather, it is about living in such a way that others will glorify our Father in heaven. Of course, this is not an easy task. It can be difficult to maintain a spirit of compassion, humility, generosity, and forgiveness in a world that is often characterized by hatred, anger, and division. We may even be met with resistance and opposition, but we are not alone. We have the Holy Spirit within us, and he empowers and guides us to reflect the glory of God. Jesus Christ began his great Sermon on the Mount by teaching the Beatitudes a list of blessings 
that define the inner character or genu um, the inner character of a genuine servant of God. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. These verses also illustrate God's um, kingdom principles, which are directly opposite of the world's value system. To the casual listener, the counterculture teaching could suggest that Christ expects his disciples to withdraw from the world. But in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus follows up immediately with an illuminating segment, leaving his true followers with no doubt as to his intended meaning. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 14, Jesus compared Christians to a city on a hill that cannot be hidden because kingdom people are meant to be a beacon in the night, providing spiritual light to a lost and dying world. Jesus said in John 9, 5, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. To his disciples, he explained, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. Jesus is the light that illuminates our lives. Everyone who puts their faith and trust in him will no longer remain in the dark. John 12, 46. As long as we live on earth, we are meant to have an influence on the people around us. The Apostle Paul taught, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the world. Live as children of light. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. The purpose of light is to give direction by making it possible to see. At night, a city on a hill shines its lights in all directions from an elevated position. The light can be seen far and wide, illuminating the way for many travelers and showing them which way to go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me in John 14, verse 6, toward Jesus and ultimately into a relationship with God the Father is the direction in which people ought to walk. The Apostle John said of Jesus, in him was life. And that light, I mean, the Apostle John said, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John chapter 1 verses 4 through 5. As Christians, we are to make the light of truth visible by sharing the gospel of salvation in Jesus and through the way we live our lives, thereby providing direction and guidance for those who are lost and living in darkness. Isaiah foresaw the coming of Jesus Christ as the, draw, um, as the dawning of a great light seen by people walking in darkness, those living in the land of deep darkness. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 and read Matthew 4 16. Saul of Tarsus had been walking in profound spiritual darkness, persecuting Christians. When Jesus Christ appeared to him, Saul saw, Saul saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me. Acts 26, 13. The Lord allowed Saul to remain temporarily blinded by the light as a symbol of his sightless spiritual state. That day God told Saul, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts 26, 16 through 18. From the moment God removed the blinders from his eyes, Saul began to preach the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Acts 9, 17 through 31. Saul, who later, became, um, who later went by the name of Paul, went on to become one of Christianity's most zealous messengers. Everywhere he went, Paul taught Christians to live clean innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. The Christian life 
is meant to have a visible impact and not to be lived in secret, hidden from the world. Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Matthew 5, 15 through 16. There's no such thing as a, co um, as a covert Christianity or clandestine discipleship. Paul advised Timothy never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. In 2 Timothy 1, 8, we must not hide our devotion to Christ. Instead, we are to remain humble when doing everything we can to attract, influence, and guide others towards the truth. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. Acts 13, 47. When we live as true disciples of Christ, obeying the principles of God's kingdom, we become like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. In fact, as new creatures in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it is now part of our nature as kingdom servants to be the light in the world. The light we shine does not come from us, but instead is a reflected light coming from our source. The Lord, who is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18. <sighs> Ephesians 5.8-9. You yourselves used to be in darkness, but since you have become the Lord's people, you are in the light. So you must live like people who belong to the light. For it is the light that brings a rich harvest of every kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Walking in the darkness can get you into trouble. You can stumble and fall, bang your toe, or bash your head. All of us are drawn to the light because light paves the way for us to move safely. The world we live in, in a way, is very dark. The erosion of core moral values and family life the me mentality, relativism are among the current trends that are not of God. And the world we live in gets darker every day. The darker the world gets, a small source of light stands out even more and is more crucial. In the midst of the darkness, God wants us to be the light of the world. So no matter how dark your environment is, people around us should see some hope and encouragement if we live like the light in the darkness. Do you see yourself as a light bearer in this dark world? What happens if there are many lights in your situation? How do you become a light in the midst of darkness? Live a respectable and reputable life. No hypocr hypocritical or double life. Little by little, Grow in holiness and character like Christ's. Be patient, kind, and loving, but do not aim to be a people pleaser. Be a God pleaser. Aim to be respected rather than liked by others. Actions speak louder than words. Before you can say anything, people tend to look at your behavior and attitude. Be able to sleep well at night knowing you lived the day in good conscience. Live as if um, you will one day give account of your life. Because you will. Choose to do the loving thing. Loving others is easy to say, but it's a lot harder to do. Um, your ability to love is limited. Seek God's love, patience, and forgiveness when yours runs out. See how loving and forgiving God is to you. Avoid arguments. Be open to sharing your opinion with others without being apologetic about it. Only if your opinion is asked. Do not generalize and be judgmental, but be kind and considerate of others' views. Start your sharing with, this is my view about it. Your opinion has more weight if you have the reputation and the character. Being loving, patient, and considerate um, to back it up. Your goal in sharing your view is not to prove them wrong or yourself right, but to bring them closer to Jesus. Consider sharing why you believe in such a way or how you used to believe the same way as they do and why you changed. 
Know your faith well. You do not need to be a theologian or a philosopher to explain your faith, but you, you need to know the basics and the whys of your beliefs. Learn and practice how to share the basic gospel, um, gospel message. Practice sharing your personal testimony with others. Seek opportunities to share your testimony. It is something they um, cannot dispute or challenge. Know that God calls you to be a light bearer in your unique situation at this time and age and be faithful to your call. Ask yourself, how can I be a mini Jesus in my family, work, school? church and community? How can I work with other light bearers around me so that together we can produce an even bigger light? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And other references can be found in Romans 13, 11 through 14, Philippians chapter 2, 15 through 16, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and 1 John um, chapter 1, 5 through 7. How do you make a difference in your workplace or school? Do people around you see a difference in you or are you just one of the crowd? Do people see you, um, do people see around you the light of Christ in you for you were once in darkness but you now now you are light in the Lord live as children of light for the fruit of light consists of in all goodness righteousness and truth and find what pleases the Lord have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret but everything exposed by the light becomes visi visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 14. Um, Paul, Paul is continuing his exhortation to Imitate God, um, to imitate God that began in Ephesians 5, 1 through 7, he called the believers to imitate God by living a life of love and by getting rid of sexual immorality of every sort, including activities, thoughts, and words. Um, here, the believers are called to imitate God by walking as children of light. In scripture, the figurative use of light has two aspects, the intellectual and the moral. Intellectually, it represents truth whereas morally it represents holiness. To live in light, therefore, means to live in truth and in holiness. The figure of darkness has the same two aspects. Intellectually, it represents ignorance and falsehood, whereas morally it connotes evil. We see this in many, many places. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. In this reference, Light refers to intellectual truth as found in God's word. In Romans 13, 12 through 14, light refers to moral deeds and darkness to immoral deeds. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, um, not in the orgies and drunkenness and in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of a sinful nature. In Isaiah 5.20, these words refer to both the intellectual and the moral. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Believers are in the light because they have changed intellectually and morally. 
How can believers continue to imitate God by living in the light? Well, let's consider six truths about living in the light. To live in the light, believers must remember that light, not darkness, is their nature. For you were once in darkness, but now you are a light in the world. Live as children of the light. Ephesians 5, 8. Paul reminds believers that they were once in darkness, but are now a light in the Lord. It is interesting to consider that he does not say believers were in darkness, but that they were darkness. That is the character of every believer before coming to Christ. There has been a definite um, character change in the life of every true believer. By using the term children of light, Paul reminds us that we have our Father's nature. Second Peter um, chapter 1, verse 4. In Psalm 27, verse 1, God is called light and salvation. This is the character and nature of God, our Father, and we have his nature. The believer is light because he knows God. Romans chapter 1, 21 through 23, describes the world as intellectual, intellectually darkened in reference to knowing God the Creator. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. People of the world have darkened minds. They profess to be wise when they are really fools. They deny the living God by worshiping false gods, or denying his existence. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The world is dark because people do not know or even acknowledge God. But believers are light because they know the light. They know God. The believer is light because he knows the gospel and scripture in general. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The world is blinded to the light of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Though the world rejects the gospel, to the believer it is the power and wisdom of God. Not only are unbelievers blinded to the gospel, they are also blinded to scripture in general. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. While the world rejects scripture and cannot understand it, it is the believer's daily bread. Matthew 4, 4 constant meditation, Psalm 1-2, and joy, Psalm 119-24. The believer is light because he practices the character of righteousness. Romans 13, 12-14 says, The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. As believers, we are called to put aside the deeds of darkness and clothe ourselves with Christ. And similarly, in 1 John 3.10, it says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Children of God are identified by their obedience to God, and unbelievers are identified by their disobedience. Essentially, to be in darkness is to be ignorant of God and his word, and to practice rebellion in regards to those things. The world is darkness, and it's becoming darker and darker every day. Every day it becomes darker. The spirit of lawlessness is at work, but I'm going to tell you something. The, the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is also at work. The believer is light 
He knows the truth about creation, the gospel, and God, and he lives in view of these realities that the world rejects. Believers must shine their light by placing it in the most strategic places. Christ says this in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are a light. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl or a basket or a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may be able to see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. All glory to God. It's not us who are, it's not our works. It's Christ working through us. And we're a beacon of light in the dark. Christians must put their light on a stand. When placing a lamp in a house, people put it in the most advantageous, um, the most, the most advantageous position. We must do the same with our lives. We must consider this when deciding where we will work, live, and go to church. How can we most effectively spread our light? Also, we must remove anything that might dim our light or make it ineffective. There are certain environments that hinder the effectiveness of our light by either causing us to hide it or by blowing it out as we succumb to temptation or shame. Are you afraid of the gospel? Are you afraid of letting people know that you are a child of God? I'm not. He wasn't ashamed to die for me. I'm not ashamed to live for him. Believers must place their light on a stand for all to see. And placing our light in the most strategic places also includes helping it get stronger and shine the brightest. Keep oil in your lamps. Keep them full and be ready at all times. For example, this might include things like being involved in a good church, uh, seeking godly members and reading the right books or sharing the gospel in any way that you can on YouTube, on Facebook. Saying God bless you to people as you walk by. Believers must avoid the temptation to hide their light. Um, in Mark 4, 21, Christ asks, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? Many commentators believe the bowl and the bed represent common reason that people hide their light. Some hide it because of work. The bowl or basket which Christ refers to is probably a bushel for collecting grain. Many believers get so busy at work that they hide the light of Christ, or they hide it so that they do, um, so as to not hinder their chance of promotion. However, our light should not be hidden under a bushel of work. And secondly, Christians tend to hide their light simply because of laziness, as symbolized by a bed. They are too lazy to go to church, read their Bibles, serve on missions, or share the gospel. No wise person puts a lamp under a bowl or a bed, and neither should believers. Our light is more important than any lamp in a house. We must strategically place our lamps in places that will minimize their output and effectiveness for the kingdom of God. And the next thing believers must do to live in the light is to produce fruit consistent with light. Paul uses several terms in describing the fruit of the light, and we can understand these terms better by comparing them with their opposites. Number one would be goodness. Goodness refers to anything that is morally excellent, including generosity. One commenter calls it love in action. It probably focuses on our relationship to others, including meeting the needs of those around us, serving them, and caring for them. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. It is the opposite of selfish, selfishness and apathy towards the needs of others. Like Christ, who is the light, we must go out of our way to serve and minister to the needs of the world and especially to believers. Are you bearing the fruit of goodness? Or are you cultivating apathy and selfishness? Righteousness, number two. There are two aspects to this fruit. First, it has to do with our, our relationship with God. Uh, Romans 4, 5 says, However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. In salvation, God gives us his son's righteousness to make us acceptable in his eyes. And secondly, it has to do with how we live. As those justified, 
and made righteous by God, we must daily practice righteousness. Um, James chapter 2 verse 17 says, Faith without works is dead. 1 John 2 29 says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. True believers practice a lifestyle of righteousness. These fruits should be continually born in our lives instead of fruits of evil and sin. And number three, truth. The third fruit of the light is um, truth. Truth has to do with honesty, reliability, trustworthiness, and integrity. In contrast to the hypocritical, deceptive, and false ways of the old life of darkness, it is conformity to the world of God in thought and action. Um, is the fruit of truth growing in your life? Or is it hypocrisy and deception? Many have noted how goodness seems to focus primarily on how we relate to others, righteousness on how we relate to God, and truth on how we relate to ourselves. As with any fruit, it is produced in the right environment. So what is the right environment? Essentially, it is our relationship with Christ. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We must make our home in Christ through prayer, his word, fellowship, um, fellowship with the saints, worship and service. As we do this, the fruits of goodness, righteousness and truth are produced in our lives. Not only must believers produce the fruit of light, but they also must continually find out what pleases the Lord. Find out can be translated as to test, discern, and approve. It was um, used of testing a metal to see if it was genuine. Those who walk in the light not only produce the type of fruit in the preceding verse, but also finds out what is acceptable to the Lord. They put every thought, word, and action to the test. What does the Lord think about this? How does, it, how does it appear in his presence? Every area of life comes under the searchlight. Conversation, standard of living, clothes, books, businesses, pleasures, entertainment, um, furniture, friendships, vacations, cars, and sports. I mean, certainly finding out what pleases the Lord also applies to knowing God's will in specific circumstances. Believers test and discern God's will by using God's word. God's word either tells us what to do or gives us principles to apply to discern God's will. In applying scripture, we should ask a question like, is it moral? Is it helpful to others? And is it honoring God? God's will never conflicts with his word. God's word is the revelation of his character and being, and it trains the man of God for all righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.17 Believers test and discern God's word by putting God first in their lives. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The more we put God first in our daily lives, through family, work, and entertainment, etc., um, the more God will make his will clear to us. If we neglect God or deprioritize him, we will not be able to discern his good and pleasing will. Believers test and discern God's will by not conforming to the patterns of the world. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and approve what is good and perfect will of God. If a believer is conforming to the world in thought or action, it will inhibit his ability to hear and discern God's guidance. Believers test and discern God's will by considering both their heart's desires and whether they have peace in their heart. Philippians 2.13 says he works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. This means that God is always working in our hearts to help us discern and to do his will. Psalms 37.4 says delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When I'm walking with God, abiding in his word, prayer, and the fellowship of the saints, many times the desires of my heart um, are of the Lord. In fellowship um, of the saints, many times the desires of my heart are for the Lord. In discerning what is pleasing to God, 
we must discern what God is doing in our hearts. But also, in considering our hearts, we must consider whether or not we have peace, as this is often an indicator of God's leading. Consider what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 12-13. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Paul lived for open doors to preach the gospel. However, he left Troas because he had no peace of mind. Many times God leads us through peace or lack of it. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Rule was used of an empire at an athletic game. The umpire calls out safe, out, or winner. This text can also be translated as, Let the peace of Christ decide. And sadly, instead of being led by God's peace, many are led by fear of the future, fear of what people think, or feel of fear of failure. God works in our hearts to do, um, to will and do of his good pleasure. He guides us by his peace, not by fear and anxiety. Believers test and discern God's will by considering the counsel of other believers. Proverbs 11:14 says there is safety and victory in the multitude of counselors. Scripture records that when God called somebody to do something, he often confirmed it through a prophet or another believer. God does the same with us. We should seek the counsel of other believers, especially in major decisions like who to marry, what school to go to, or what job to take. God often guides us through the counsel of the wise believers. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Believers test and discern God's will by considering open and closed doors. God is sovereign in all things. Many times he makes his will clear by closing or opening doors. If we're going to walk in the light, we must find out what is pleasing to God. We do this by bringing every thought and decision before the Lord so he can shine his light on it. He clarifies his will through his word. Other believers, our hearts, and, and his sovereignty, among other things, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Ephesians 5, 11 through 12. The next thing believers do uh, must do to live in the light is to not partake in darkness, but to expose it instead. The verb translated here as expose can also carry the idea of reproof, correction, punishment, or discipline. Believers expose darkness indirectly by living holy lives. Many times it will simply be the fact that believers do not curse, cheat, or get drunk have sex outside of marriage, or lies that expose the sin, or um, or lie that exposes the sin in others' lives. A life of light exposes the sins of those around it. The rebuke of the light typically invokes either desire to change or anger. 1 Peter 4, um, 3 through 4 says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, kerosene, and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipa uh, dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. In a world that loves darkness and hates light, believers will constantly be mocked thought strange, and sometimes persecuted for living a lifestyle of holiness. John 3, 19 through 20 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. One must realize that living a holy life is both rare and strange in this world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire for not bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's um, um, great idol in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel was cast into the lion's den simply because he prayed three times a day to the true God instead of false gods in Daniel 6. 
Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified. We must welcome the cross um, our own Savior bore. He was the light and the world hated him. We will often receive that same displeasure. Are you willing to be different, even if it means being considered strange or hated? Believers expose darkness directly by words of correction. Our exposure of darkness is not just indirect, it is also direct. We must call lying sin, cheating sin, adultery is sin, and fornication and homosexuality is sin, again, often incurring the wrath of the world for doing so. We need to be ethical light when we are in the office, in the classroom, in the shop, and in the church. We must be willing to risk being called negative, narrow, judgmental, bigoted. If God's Spirit is calling us to stand up against the wrong, it is up to us to be faithful to God's calling. But we must not only expose the darkness by calling it darkness, we must also expose the darkness with the gospel. One cannot preach the gospel without exposing sin. Sadly, this is often neglected in gospel presentations. The gospel says that all men are sinners under the judgment of a holy God. Romans 3.23 and 6.23. It calls men to repent of their lifestyles of sin and turn to Jesus to save them. Yes, we must expose the darkness by teaching the gospel to a world under God's wrath. Are you willing to expose sin through correction and sharing the gospel with others? Believers must wisely not discuss many of the details of events that happen in the darkness. By discussing these, they give life to them and contaminate others with filth. Some things are so vile that they should be discussed in as little detail as possible, because even describing them is morally and spiritually dangerous. Some diseases, chemicals, and nuclear byproducts are so extremely deadly that even the most highly trained and best protected technicians and scientists who work with them are in constant danger. No sensible person would work around such things carelessly or haphazardly. And in the same way, some things are so spiritually disgraceful and dangerous that they should be sealed off not only from direct contact, but even from conversations. They should be exposed only to the extent necessary to be rid of them. Some books and articles written by Christians on various moral issues are so explicit that they almost do as much to spread as to cure the problem. We can give God's diagnosis and solution for sins without portraying every sordid detail by choosing to refrain from certain conversations and jokes. It again shows how perverse the world is. Believers must use wisdom in their conversations and interactions. Every word must be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Colossians 4, 6. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. Ephesians 5.13 And, you know, in order to live in the light, believers must convert darkness into light. For it is light that makes everything visible. Can also be translated, for everything that becomes visible is light. When light touches something, it becomes light. It is lit up, and to some degree, the object gives off light itself. It is converted and changed. In the same way, the light of a believer's life often changes a work environment as sin is exposed and righteousness replaces it. It changes people's lives as they repent and give their lives to Christ. Light is by nature more powerful than darkness. It changes environments and it changes lives. 1 Peter chapter 2.12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Though believers are persecuted and mocked by the world, their conduct often leads to change in those around them, even if only slowly. When Christ comes, many will glorify God for the chaste life of a Christian co-worker, friend, or family member who led them to Christ. Peter also says this to believing wives of unbelieving husbands in 1 Peter 3, 1-2. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands so that 
if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. The pure and holy life of a godly wife often changes an unbelieving husband even without words. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Ephesians 5.14 Commenters are, um, com Many of the commentators are not sure where this quote comes from, and some believe he's drawing from Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Others believe he's drawing from an Esther hymn sung by the early church, and it was probably used as an invitation to unbelievers visiting congregations. And either way, Paul clearly calls for Christians to preach to those who are asleep. The actions and words of Christians should speak to unbelievers, encouraging them to repent and follow Christ. But they also speak to believers, as is probably the focus in this context. There are many believers living a lifestyle of darkness who need to repent. 